We are on. <laughs> All right. Welcome to Ever Christian Church. We're going to have a good time today. God's moving in a very special way. we got a very special message today, and I hope everybody takes it to heart. And if you're going to throw vegetables, make sure they're real vegetables, not canned vegetables. <laughs> Let's all stand up in good word of prayer. Everybody stand up. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Go ahead. This is the year that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen, amen, amen. Give Lord a hand clap of praise. Go to the next one there. These are the say to me, these are the two most important hours of my week. Help me to cherish them. I'm here today to worship, not to be entertained. I'm singing to an audience of one. Accept my worship, oh Lord. Give the Lord another hand clap of praise. Now what's the to say? Lord, lift your name on high. There we go. Y'all ready to lift God's name on high? Amen. Alright, God's so good all the time. Let me turn this thing on my hill. Well, all was turned on. There you go. Here we go. Ready? We're going to, let's just leave it me and bro. Ready?
and you can drop it off there or you can drop it off on the way out. If you've already dropped your offering in, hold your hand up. If you haven't dropped your offering in, hold your offering up. And we're going to repeat this together. If I got it up there, did I have it up there? I don't? No, I didn't. All right. Isn't that good? <laughs> this is my offering. This is my seed. Say it with me. This is my seed. I give it to you. Lord, I know it may leave my hand, but it never leaves yours in my life. I ask you right now, Lord, to bless it and anoint it in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Glory to the Lamb of God. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Brother Branson. Lord, prayer at this time. Does anybody have an outspoken request this morning? Amen. Uplifted hands, special needs, lost loved ones. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you for the time and opportunity that we have today to be in your house gather together in one mind and one accord to worship your name, Father. We just ask that you would bless Lionel. Father, let your presence come down and touch each and every life, each and every situation in this service this morning, Father. You see the hearts, you know the needs, supply them according to your riches, and Lord, that testimony may be given. Now, Father, be with us in the remainder of this service today. Let the message go forth, touch our hearts, and draw us closer into you, and Father, we thank you for everything that's said and done. In Christ Jesus' name, the church. Also, remember, remember my wife Linda, she still has the effects of COVID. She says it feels like she has jelly in her lungs. Remember her. And DC still has that clap. The collapsed lung is working its way through. And uh, he called a cable across here, so his torus muscles all up here. So I think the doctor said it might take a month to get his lung back and up to six months to get, it, get this back. But it says it even hurts open the door. And so uh, remember him in prayer and the other guy that fell with him. All right, God's got this. Don't say that. God's got this. Ready? I feel the rain. I feel the rain.
Yes. God is so good. Now today is going to be a little different. Uh, I made a mistake of announcing it last week. <laughs> uh, get ready. I have people ask me this all the time. They ask me this all the time. I hear it every day to my life, just about. And that is, Pastor, how do I forgive and forget? Because the Bible says God forgives and forgets. And I want to be like Him. Well, we're, we're going we're to talk about that because there's all kinds of stuff in here. And I'm going to take my time and I promise you that it's going to be very enlightening and it's going to possibly, if you let it, sink in, make a difference in your life at this moment. And it will help you in the oncoming weeks. All right. How many in here has just raised your hand has ever had any relationship problems? Everybody raise your hand. Your wife's not here, fellas. Raise your hands. All right. How I many there ever? <laughs> How I many in here has got relationship problems with your family, with your friends, with people you work with, and sometimes these these problems wind up so heavy on you that it hinders your work, it hinders your love, it hinders your ability to minister to everybody around. And so it's very important that we learn how, just like God, to forgive. I hear him all the time say, don't see us. Well, I forgave him, but I didn't forget it. How many ever heard of that? How many ever said that? I forgave them, but I'm not going to forget it. Or, I saw one guy said, <laughs> on one of the shows, it was a, a mafia guy. Uh, he said, forget it. He said, I'll forgive them, but forget it. He said, I said, I don't have Alzheimer's and I ain't Jesus. <laughs> All right. So, we're going to talk about that today. And I promise you, it's not what you're thinking, hopefully. And you'll see a different view of this when we get through. Everybody stand up. i got it written up here so you don't have to even get your Bible unless you want to. Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. We're talking about Ephraim and Manasseh. Genesis 41. So you read it right up here. Or you got you looking at our your Bible if you like. That's fine. That's all up to you. I got it so you can have it. And then the Joseph were born two sons from the years of famine, when the, before the years of famine came. When Asnath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of Om, bare unto him. Man, look at those names. And Joseph said, or called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For, for God, he said, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Wow. Does that mean he just wiped his memory clean? He got zip. No, that's not what it means. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God hath called me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And the seven years of plenty that was in the land of Egypt was ended. And the seven years of dark began to come, according to Joseph had said. And the dark was in all the land, but in all the land of Egypt, there was Bread. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, God, that you are alive and well on the throne, Father. I thank you, God, that we don't have to worry about what happens in our lives, God. You're on top of it. Lord, I know it comes to us, and Lord, it's okay to be concerned, but we don't have to be worried. There is a difference. Concern is I can do something about it. I can pray about it. I can do whatever. When I'm worried, I can't do a thing about it. It takes everything out of my hands. I ask you right now, Lord, to... Help us, God, to understand you better today and to do unto you, Lord, as you would do unto us. And help us, God, to learn how to forgive 
and forgive. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, Y'all can be seated. Talk about forgiving and forgetting. I was counseling with a couple one day, and I said, well, uh, Y'all start talking. And the husband said, I don't know what to do with her, man. He said, he said, his wife said, When I get mad at you, you never fight back. How do you control your anger? Wife said, I clean the toilet. And she said, well, how does that help? She said, I use your toothbrush. <laughs> ah, I know. Throw the book away. Here we go. Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, now, I want you to see something here. Manasseh means causing to forget even deeper. It gets a lot deeper meaning than that, but that's the surface meaning. Causing to forget. Ephraim, that's Manasseh. Ephraim means double fruit, but that's even got a deeper meaning. And so as you start exploring the meaning of these words, remember, Hebrews, the Hebrew language, the Greek language, they all in the Latin language, they all paint pictures with words. And so there's a picture here that really encompasses probably 20 years of this man's life. Can you imagine 20 whole years? Wow. Some of us, we have a problem with what happened yesterday. Can you imagine carrying some of this stuff around with you for 20 years? And in the middle of it, when it's at its absolute worst, you still trust God. And then, guess what? God bless us. So, let's watch this. I'm going to say two, two things about this. Now, I'm just going to put this up here now, and we'll talk about it later in this message. I want to say two things about this, these names. Their power and their position. Just remember, they'll say power, power. Position. position. Once you remember these, because this is very, very important. So let's just go a little bit further here. So now we're, we're talking about uh, uh, forgiving and forget. Now, now look, let me back up. What does it mean when God says he forgives and forgives? He says, I'm going to read some of these scriptures to you. Then we're going to go into it deeper. Again, you've got to really dig down deep. Because if you don't dig down deep, you're going to get some kind of five-cent solution to a hundred-dollar question. Or you've got a million-dollar problem and a five-dollar solution that doesn't work. So, so, so that's just a little bit further in this thing. Out. So, so when you look at what God says, look, to forget, watch this, Rick, watch this carefully. To forget does not mean to fail to remember. Ready? To forget does not mean fail to remember. A proper senility, hypnosis, or brain malfunction. None but your person can forget what happened in the past. Matter of fact, your brain is a computer. It's a mega computer. And your brain stores up memories. Although you may not can recall them readily all the time, they are there. And certain things happen... And when they happen, all of a sudden you remember these things. Now, now we may wish that we could erase bad memories, but you can't. So, so when I'm talking about forgive and forget, don't think because you still remember what happened that something must be wrong with you. You know, you're not spiritual enough. Because if you were spiritual enough, you could forget it ever happened. That is not what this is talking about. Amen. So watch this. To forget in the Bible. Listen carefully. To forget in the Bible means to no longer be influenced by or affected by. That's what forget means. I gotta say it again. To forget means to no longer be influenced by or affected by. God says in Hebrews 10 and 17, and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. Meaning God says, you know what? I'm not affected by them anymore. Because when I look at them, I see the blood of Jesus. And because I see the blood of Jesus covering them with their, their robes of white because of the blood of Jesus, when I see the blood of Jesus, then I'm not holding them accountable for what they ask God to forgive them for. Jesus to take over. So, 
Somebody says, oh, well, can, can God remember? Well, God's omniscient. And because God's omniscient, he's all-knowing. Because he's all-knowing, yes, he can remember, but he chooses not to. He chooses not to hold it against us. He chooses not to use it against us or use it for the betterment of something else. So it's very powerful. So now, now so, so, so watch this. Again, uh, he's not suggesting that he will conveniently have a bad memory. Why? Like I said, this is impossible with God. Watch this. Because this is what, if you're going to be like God, this is the start of forgiving and forgetting. Watch this. God is saying, I will no longer hold their sins against them. Their sins can no longer affect their standing with me or influence my attitude toward them. Woo! Somebody go, woo! That's powerful. So, when God says, I'm not going to remember anymore, watch this. I'm not holding against them. It's not going to affect their standing with me. And I'm, it's not going to affect how I see them. Because now I have forgotten it. Wow, this is powerful. So let's go through the scriptures here. There's a whole bunch of There's so many up there. You can't even think of all of them. There's just so many. I'm just going to read a few of them. Isaiah 43 and 25. I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. I will not remember your sins. 2 Corinthians 5 and 19. For God, was in, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. He gave up this wonderful message, or gave out this, gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Hebrews 10 and 17. He says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. Psalm 103. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is he, his steadfast love to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Think about it. As far as the east is from the west. You can measure on a compass north and south. You can you know, you know where north ends and south begins and vice versa. On a compass, you can never find where east begins and west takes over because it's always like this. It's never ending. You can't see, there's no dividing point. There's a dividing point north and south, no dividing point east and west. God says, as far as that is, that's how much I have forgiven you. Some of us are sitting around beating ourselves up, not realizing God's got this. So, <clears throat> Hebrews 8 and 12. I will forgive their wickedness and never again remember their sins. Wow. That's powerful. How many, don't raise your hands, how many just this week just beat yourself up over something you did in previous times and you, you won't let it go and you're standing guilty before God not because he's the one pounding the gavel. You are. Wow. Wow. Don't raise your hands. When God forgave it, it, it changed the look. He's got a good attitude towards you. He's not holding against you. He wants the best for you. All right? So now, because God did this, get ready. <laughs> this is tough. Now, we I mean, get ready. That's why I say this is tough. tough. All right, ready? Forgive and forget. When we learn how to forgive and forget, it's taking, watch this, it's taking forgiveness to the next level. It is the most like God that we can be. And in order to be like God when it comes to forgive and forget, it's going to require God to help us. So here we are. Forgive and forget. There's, I mean, there's people along the way that, that you know, I, I very much remember when I got promoted to management at Fountain, uh, my boss man he actually, he was the vice president engineer and he left the company. When he left the company, they, they divided up engineering into three engineering parts. One was, one was industrial engineering, that was me. And then there was uh, racing and sport boat, that was Mike Good. And there was a guy named David, he took over the military and fishing boats. And so that was us, they were designed, I was industrial. And so, I, I remember, that I was in charge of ISO. Anybody knows what ISO 9000 is? It's something to make sure everything's built the same way over and over and over again. It's a very powerful stamp on your equipment and, and, and it means something to the entire world. 
So we were very strong on that. It cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to get that certification. And so we're in there trying to get this stuff done, and there's this one guy who hated my boss. Hated him. And when I took over, I let him take over that, I took over safety manager. So this guy here was in both of them. And he was in the, in the, in the team. This guy here, always, he called me and got my boss man's name all the time. And he just, I mean, he just eat me up, left and right. Sometimes he even sabotaged me. Every time I got around him, he would even at times cuss me. And I would stay calm, and I would stay cool, and I would just say, God, he's one of your children, I gotta love him. And so, I would keep talking good to him, and he would keep cussing me. And he'd keep talking junk about me. And I remember, after about a year of him cussing me, and talking junk about me all over the place, we had a problem coming up with two boats. These were me and Donald boats. And these boats had, well, he, did, he did powder coat, and these boats had bad powder coat. It would look so bad, it looked like a five-year-old had done it on a million dollar boat. Well, quite a million, say half a million dollar boat, about 500,000, so a million dollars together. And they come down and said, they're getting ready to fire him for that shabby work. And so, Here's my chance. <laughs> I can get him back now and be legal about it. I can get him back and do my job and he gone. Cuss me for a year, talk bad about me, eat me up. He come to me and he said, man, they get ready to take my job. He said, I'm going to support my family. I don't know what I'm going to do. He had never been humble to me before, ever. He was humble that day. And he said, man, you got to help me. Now, I'd already forgiven him for what he had done. But it was hard to forgive because he kept on doing it. He kept on doing it. He kept on doing it. So when he came to me this time, I said, God, you, i, I got to be like you. I can't be like me. i got to be like you. Help me, help me, help me. And so I said, hold on. We're not through yet. Give me a chance to look at it. And so I went back into the computers and went back into the logs. And I went back and I found out these two boats that he was accused of messing up royally and making it like a five-year-old had done it actually had been done by his predecessor who was leaving the company. And they crossed over, their work crossed over as he was learning and the other guy was leaving. And the other guy had done it. But if you hadn't really researched it, really, 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 really micro strong, it looked like he did it. And so I went to Mr. Fountain and went to the powers of the and I said, this guy didn't do this. I said, it's the guy that y'all had fired for sorry work. He did this and he was just trying to leave y'all a little, leave a little something to remember him by. That guy came to me and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Never cuss me again. Quit calling me all those names. He started calling me Reverend, Reverend, Reverend. And we worked together for years there. Everything was cool. After I left the company, Years later, he retired and moved beside my father. Well, I didn't know this. And he told my father he just retired from family. He said, oh, do you know my son, my son-in-law, David Linton? And he said, the man started crying. And he said, did he hurt you? <laughs> he said, no. He said, that man saved my job. He said, he had all rights, uh, all rights to lay it to me because I treated him so bad. He said, but he went more than the extra mile. And he saved my job. And he said, there's nothing on this earth I wouldn't do for that man. It's amazing how when you can learn not just to forgive, but forgetting God's standards. Not in our standards. Our standards maybe just wipe it away. No, it was still there. It was fresh. Every time I get around and get up in his mouth, I'd expect to be cussed. Every time I get up in his mouth, I expect that something happened. You know, but, but, but remember, it's not forget like a race your memory. It is I'm not going to hold it against them. It's not going to change my attitude toward them. And I'm going to do what I can to what is necessary to help them. So now watch this. Ready? Here we go. How do we 
who can give and forget like God? There's so many examples in the Bible. The Bible is full of them. But when I was preaching last Sunday, I kept hearing, tell them how to forgive and forget, forgive and forget, forgive and forget. And I, while I'm preaching to y'all, I'm having a conversation with God too. I said, but how? And I kept hearing, tell them about Joseph, tell them about Joseph, tell them about Joseph. So I went home this week, and I worked on it, and researched Joseph, and here it is. Let's, let's not just look at him. Ooh. Let's look at his journey. We've got to do something about his Watch this. Please don't trip over those wires. But guess what, honey? If you're watching, I just did it. I mean, this one saying when you get home, you'll hear about it. I told you so. Okay, dear, I'm going to say it for you. You told me so. Get ready. No, it's not going to work. <laughs> A lot can happen between God's promises and the palace. A lot can happen when God gives you a dream and when that dream is fulfilled. A lot can happen while you're waiting on God to fulfill what He already told you He was going to do. So let's just talk about, let's just talk about this. From Exodus uh, uh, 37 to Exodus 50. We're not going to read all that. Y'all want to read Exodus 37 to 50? I'll stand for the reading of the word. <laughs> so ready, get ready. Here it comes. Get ready. He had a dream, which was a promise. The dream started. He had a coat of many colors. He was his dad's favorite, which that right there is enough to make other people upset with you. You know, because you're sitting back wondering, uh, uh, when's my turn? Why is there, why he get everything? He had a coat of many colors, which is representative of royalty and his love from his father. So, so he has this dream that he's going to wind up actually uh, saving the world. He didn't understand the dream, but that's what it was saying is, God was saying, you're going to wind up saving the world. He didn't know that. He was a picture, just a picture and type of Christ. When Christ did what he did, Christ was the Savior of the world. He's going to wind up being in his way the Savior of the world. But along the way, his brothers couldn't stand him. And we talk about Joseph didn't have any bad, bad habits. He did. Joseph had a real bad habit. He couldn't keep his mouth shut. Not only could he keep, keep his mouth shut, he loved to talk about it. And, you know, God's going to use me. God's going to use me. Think what God's going to do. God, God. Maybe he's set in his ways, but it's enough to make his brothers even matter because he was kind of kind of arrogant. Okay? Look it up. Read about it as you read. You might not say Joseph was arrogant, but as you read Joseph's life, you can see where there was arrogance in his life. So, so his promise. Then there was the pit. It got stalled. His promise became a nightmare. Because now, now his brother said, we're going to kill him. He comes out wearing the coat of many colors. His brothers are working. He's not. He comes up and he's going to, he just rubs it in. And so they take him. They're going to kill him. Then Reuben comes off and says, let's don't kill him. Hoping that he can put him in his pit. Leave him there for a while. Then bring him back to his father. But instead, Reuben gets him to put him in the pit. He leaves him. He leaves. They sell him into slavery. Wow. I mean, a room comes back and says, well, where's, where's our money at? Well, the Ishmaelites have got him. So, so he sold into slavery. Now, his dream is a nightmare. Some of y'all in here right now might be in that stage. You've had a dream, but at the moment it's a nightmare. And then he goes to Potiphar's house. They sell him to Potiphar, which was the captain of Pharaoh. So he goes in there, and again, now he's stalled again. Is stalled because now he, he, he's a servant, but now his wife, uh, Potiphar's wife, likes him, and she tries to come on to him. He won't have anything to do with it. Eventually, she can't take it anymore. She comes after him. She brings it to him, and she, he runs from her, and she takes off his coat when he's running and winds up telling, telling her husband that he tried to molest her. So now he's lied on, and now he's going to prison. Now this all started when he was 17. 17 years old. This is the beginning. It's all the way to 30 when he gets out of this. So now, after leaving Potiphar, he goes to prison. 
The book of Psalms tells us that his legs were in shackles. So he wasn't just walking around like some of these guys in the government when they go to prison and play a tennis and you know they got massages and all. No, he was in prison. He was shackled and it wasn't pleasant. But God was there with him. So, so prison. Anyway, he's in prison. He gets he, he hears the butler and the baker tell about these dreams. And because he's a dreamer and he can handle dreams, he tells them what's going to happen and what he said happened happened. The baker died in three days. The butler was restored in three days. The butler said, "I'm going to tell Pharaoh about you." And when he got there, he forgot for two more years. Joseph's there. So now. He had hope, then he had no hope, then he had hope, then he had no hope, he had hope, then he had no hope. And now 28 years old, when the, when the, bank, the butler's going in, so I'm going to go tell Pharaoh right now, it's the most hope he had had in years. And then he begins, the, bank, the butler forgets, and so here he is again. He's in prison. But Pharaoh has a dream. Why Pharaoh has a dream, nobody can give interpretation. And the butler goes, wait a minute, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I do know a guy that can do this. And so they call him in. So then he winds up in the palace. The dream starts all over again. Every last one of us can look at our life. And I can ask you right now, where you at in that? Where you at? Are you in the pit? You in Potiphar? You in prison? In the pit, spinning your wheels. Potiphar, you're being suppressed or being captive to somebody else's prison. You're just locked down. You're waiting for a dream to take place. All you got is a nightmare. But the day's coming when it's going to take place. Now remember, all these people in 13 years that Joseph has tried, they've tried to hurt Joseph and make life miserable. I want you to know something. The Bible says many times that the Lord was with Joseph. In all of this, whatever you're in today, wherever you're at today, God is with you. So the Lord was with Joseph, number one. And number two, Joseph, when he got looking to see God's fingerprint, oh, you can't see it there, you can't see it right now. What you're going through right now, you maybe cannot see it, but later on you'll look back and you will see God's fingerprints all over what you're going through. I tell people when somebody dies, I'll tell them later on, I'll say maybe, think about this, maybe you didn't see it when it was for the last few, few, few years, but let me ask you a question. Now that the person's dead, you've gone through what you've gone through, can you look back and see God's fingerprints? And inevitably, everybody says, yes, now I can see God's fingerprints. He was preparing me for what was to come. I just didn't know it at the time. When you're in this position, you can't see God's fingerprints. All you see and all you can think about is the people that put you there. Mm. How many times have you said, man, I wish I could get my hands on or man, I wish I could. I, God, if there was a way I could do unto them as they done unto me, God, can you bend the rules just a little bit for me? God, is there a way I can give a good old butt whipping and then ask you to forgive me and at least I feel satisfied? No. So number one, God was with Joseph. Number two, you can see God's fingerprints all over his life. Number three, he had God's favor. Everywhere you look, he had God's favor. Everywhere he went, God was blessing him. So now, get ready. Now he's in a position huh, where he can do something. Now he's in a position where all the people that hurt him, he can take care of them now. Matter of fact, the only person Joseph had to talk to, or had, not excuse me, the only person Joseph had to answer to was Pharaoh. That's it. Pharaoh. So because all the person he had to answer to was Pharaoh, and everybody in Egypt had to answer to him, Pharaoh became like a father to him. So now he's got 
ability with the dream coming to make a difference in any way he chooses. So now he's gone from the promise to the pit, to Potiphar, to prison, to palace, and now the proof. So now, what, what, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to take place? You see, look at this. Read that. Read it out loud, everybody. <laughs> Read that last word. The Lord forgives, the Lord forgets. Wow. <laughs> Get ready. Hey, you want to put your steel toes on? This is when we get this is when it gets good. Alright. Again, this is taking forgiveness to the next level. It is the most like God that you can be, and it requires God to enable you to do this. So watch this. Ready? How in the world do they do this? Instead of focusing on the hand that brought him the problems, they focus on the hand that brought him the promise. Well, come on now. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Not another thing about it. I'm getting, ready to, I'm getting ready to get ready to jump in real hard now. Instead of focusing on the hand that brought the problems, they focus on the hand that brought the promise. You see, as long as you watching the hand that brought you the problems, you're gonna be thinking about revenge. You're gonna be thinking about ways to get things done to hurt them or to or to, to mess them up or to cause them problems. Or I'm just not gonna be there when they need me. Blah 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 blah. <laughs> All this stuff's going on in your mind because you're focusing on the hand that brought the problems. But watch this. How can you focus on the hand that brought the problems? Watch this. He realized that God used his problems as a vehicle. To bring him into the promise. Woo! Some of say amen, hallelujah, ouch, something. Amen. He realized that all those problems he went through was his vehicle that got him an audience with Pharaoh. If he had not gone through all this, then he would not have won. He would not be in a position mentally to handle this because he was still arrogant. And he would not have been in a position to talk to Pharaoh because Pharaoh wouldn't have had a word to say to him because he was an Israelite. Nope, got nothing to do with him. But being in prison, he was right there to interpret the dreams. And then when they got forgotten for two years, you think he's just being forgotten? No, God was not ready to use him yet. So it was the time. And so now, here's the time. He's in the right place at the right time. So now, all his brothers, the Ishmaelites, the, the, the uh, Potiphar and his wife, the, the, the prison guards, the prisoners, the baker, the butler, he can all look at every last one of them. Instead of saying, look what y'all done to me, he can look at them and say, thank you. Hmm. That's a hard one to chew on, ain't it? Thank you. Because if you hadn't have done this, I wouldn't have been here when I was needed. If you hadn't have done this, my attitude would not have been right. If I had you had done this to me, my position would not be in a position to do what I needed to do. I can look back over my life and think of many times where I was passed over, or many times I was pushed over here, or done this to, and at a time I said, I don't understand it, God, but later on I understood, and I said, wait a minute, now I realize my, my problem is a vehicle to get me to my promise. Some of you on here right now, if you could just get that in your head, your, pro your problem is a vehicle to get you to your promise. Amen? Now, if you don't see it that way, then think of it as a Ford and it ain't going to get you anywhere. I just played it. Just played it. So here we go. Get ready. We're getting ready. Genesis 45, 4 through 5. Ready? Very, very, very powerful. I'm almost through, believe it or not. 
And Joseph said to his brethren, come near to me, I pray. He's revealing himself to his brothers. They're coming looking for food. Here's his chance to get up. I, I was, they, had, they sold me into slavery. They hated me. And then he went from 17 to now he is about 35. Matter of fact, no, he's more like 37. So he's 37. A 17-year-old and a 37-year-old looks entirely different. And so he are, when they left, when they sold him into slavery, he was a 17-year-old snotty nosed kid, arrogant kid. And now he is the most powerful man in the world next to Pharaoh. And they go to him to get food, and he could have said, away with their kids, and guess what happened? He could have said, you know what? These guys need to be sold into slavery. I'm going to get them back. They'll show them. Or he could have just said, just be gone. I don't have time for y'all to be gone. But instead, Joseph said to his brother, come near to me. And of course, he played some games with them along the way. But we're going to talk about we're talk right here to talk about all the games that he played back and forth with him. But this is when he's revealing himself. They didn't know who he was. So, he says to his brother, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me <coughs> before you to preserve life. Now, what about that? Well, first off, he acknowledged the pain. There was pain. Good God, there was pain. Man, did he hurt. All those years in shackles, being put in a pit, not knowing what's going to happen when he sold into slavery, going to Potiphar's house, being in the prison for 10 years plus, an innocent man. The pain was real. I'm not here telling you that if you've been done wrong, the pain is not real. The pain is real. Somebody said to me, the pain is real. I have people all the time I'm counseling with me go, you, if you just understood just that much, you'll be telling me what you're telling me about the grace blanket. I <laughs> said, dude, you have no idea. We've all got our our Judases. We've all got our Joseph's brothers. We've all got this. The Bible says there's not an affliction that you've had that has not already happened to somebody else. So having the problem is not the problem. It's what do you do with the problem. So there is the pain of man, but there's the plan of God. God was using this as the vehicle, so the product of it all. If you look at it this way, Man, oh man, is this, oh man, this makes it so real. Romans 8, 28, and 5 version. Be assured and know that God being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good. And for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, his design and purpose. So all pain, all heartache. Do y'all remember that Sunday I came in here and I said, I had an easy make oven up here. And I said, how many here like sugar cookies? And y'all all raised your hand. I said, who wants a sugar cookie? The hands went up everywhere. And I had little lunch bags. And I started throwing them out. And people started looking at me, huh? Somebody got brown sugar. Somebody got sugar. Some got bacon powder. Some got flour. And they said, we can't eat this. I said, oh, we give them back. And I poured them in a bowl, and I had eggs, poured them in a bowl, mixed them up, stuck them in these back up, and of course they weren't the ones I pulled out. I actually had gourmet sugar cookies from a bakery, the best I could find. And when the bell rang, I was preaching, when the bell rang, I brought out the sugar cookies. And everybody thought about how great they were, and I said, see? We read about first, this is the day that the Lord has made. That word made means literally one of the words is recipe, designed, a recipe. 
And then we read this, Romans 8, 28. And in order for your life to be complete, God takes the good, the bad, the ugly. When you were good, when you were bad, when somebody was good to you, somebody was bad to you. The good things you learned, the bad things you learned. He puts it all together. Takes everything you've ever been through, and that's what makes you unique. Because nobody has been through what you've been through. That's a fact. Even if you've been sitting there with your wife and y'all both going through something, you're still going to go through it differently because you are made up differently. And so, God uses it all to make something great. So now, I'm almost through. Let's go back to what we call before. Manasseh causing to forget. Ephraim, double fruit. Now, now we're going to see a little bit different. You see why? Watch. The word power, the power in those names. Manasseh, you caused me to forget. Means that he brought, you brought me, God, to a place of peace. Because what they've done to me is no longer destroying me. Wow. I'm not kidding. I'd be talking to somebody. It even happens to me sometimes. A certain person's mentioned. A certain song is playing. I think about something. And all of a sudden my good mood becomes a bad mood. Because I remember what somebody did. And I have to remind myself no, that I forgave them. And God's helped me to forget it. Just like that guy found him. I had a chance, I had a choice to have him fired. I could have just said, that was what the papers say, you did it, and you're gone, bro. Last known you, go cuss somebody else. But instead, I went the extra, extra mile and researched to the very finest of numbers. And when I went to the very finest of numbers, I found out that it was not his name, but it was the other guy's name. They thought he was gone during all this. <coughs> He just was on his way out of the door. So, the power is you brought me to a place that's no longer destroying me. And you brought me to a place of power and now I can give it truly and fully to God. I'm not going to have to harbor it. Whenever I start thinking about it, I can say, nope, I gave it to God. That's where it's going to stay. So, the power is you brought me to a place of peace and a place of power. He brought him to that same place. It was no longer destroying him. All those people that tried to kill him, he realized now that God was doing something special. He said, God brought me here. And a position, he brought me to a productive place. So watch, watch this now. The position, first he had to forget, and then he had double fruit. <laughs> he could have had double fruit as long as he had forgot. It had to be this way. Forgetting all this, and then the power. And that forget is I have not forgot. I remember the pain. I remember the pain. But I'm not going to hold it against them. Alright. So. Productive again. And plenty. It said double fruit. In other words. The pain he went through. Made him. More productive. Than he was. Before the pain. So y'all can sit here. I'm not going to say that. You know, I, there was a lot of things I could do a whole lot different before I got hurt. Now I don't feel like doing it, blah, 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 blah. But the truth is, after you've been through something, it changes. I was going to be five one day, and I was talking about pressure. We were talking all about pressure. And there was this one guy they called Hillbilly. They weren't taking him serious. He got from West Virginia. And he kind of talked kind of sometimes kind of crazy and acted kind of crazy and they didn't take him serious. And we're talking about pressure and being under a load and all that. And he got everything. He, he said, can I say something? We have a group and he said, can I say something? And I heard some of the guys start snickering. <coughs> I said, go ahead. He said, I was a coal miner. And he said, I was several miles in the heart of the earth. And he said, the coal mine came in. And he said, I was thrown on my belly. 
I was covered with rocks. I could not move. And I think it was 12, 18 hours. I could not move. He says, I know about pressure. And all of a sudden, everybody quit laughing at him. He says, as long as I had the radio, they were trying to tell me how to breathe and conserve my air. So I wouldn't die before they got to me. He said, by the time they got to me, I was just about gone. Just like this, on his belly, 12 hours, covered in rocks, miles down on the earth with no light. The more he talked, the more we all squirmed. And honestly, as he started describing it, how he had asked him how he feel about it, what was going on through his mind, I wanted so bad to say, stop! But I would. And as he began to tell that story, he said, when they finally got him out and revived him, I said, how long was it before you went back in that coal mine? He said, I quit that day. I said, you're a wise man. <laughs> he said, I never went back down in the mine. But you see, everybody was joking with him and laughing at him because of his accent, how he acted kind of goofy until that story there was no more of that after that day because of what he went through it became something different and it might have been something special unique to him that we were all feeling. I watched the guys as he was telling the story they were going my kid they were going And I, I watched other guys that just held their head down and close their, close their eyes. And were, as he's telling that story, he said, man, I thought I was dead, man. I couldn't breathe. Rocks will be You see, he became more productive after that than he was before. Because I watched 12 guys humble right now and watch them change their attitudes because of what he had been through. Getting ready to close. Getting ready. Don't mean anything. It just means that I'm starting to put the brakes on. Genesis 50, 18 to 21. And his brother also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I for am I in the place of God. His brothers were scared of him now. Once they realized who it is and knew what they'd done to him, oh man, oh man, I can't believe this is the guy we're going to, the most powerful man in the world next to Pharaoh. He's the same kid that we, we, we sent into slavery. We're going to kill him. We lied to daddy and said he was dead. Daddy thinks he's dead. We've got him out of our hair. And now, here he is, the most powerful man in the world, and he can just squash us like a bug. And Joseph said, fear not. I, am I in the place of God? He says, but as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore, fear you not. I will nourish you and your little ones and be comforted and he spake kindly unto them. Remember what forgiveness is. They forget it. It changes your attitude. Your attitude is no longer negative on that person. What you will do for him is no longer negative. This is exactly what he did. He forgot. Does it mean he, he didn't say that he didn't remember it? He remembered it. But he forgot to the point where it was no longer used to be held over their head. You know, Manasseh means God didn't make me forget. Uh, he said it means God made me forget all my trouble and my father's household. See, a lot of us in here got some painful memories. I mean painful memories. But when God brings you to the point where you can forget 
What it means is, it doesn't mean you won't recollect the past, but it means you can remember without feelings of crippling grief, without feelings of loneliness, without feelings of, of, of despair. I mean, this guy came from a dysfunctional family. Uh, he had his own youth crisis going on. He had a crisis of faith. He had emotional baggage. He had all this stuff going on. But he gave it to God and realized every time he said, he talks about the pain, but he remembers the pain is a vehicle to bring him to the promise. And then fruitfulness. That word fruitfulness not only does it mean double fruit, to be twice as fruitful, but it also means double portion. And it also means, watch this, he had a blessing of fruitfulness even while he was still in the land of his suffering. Even while you were going through something, he was there. So, so watch this, I'm closing. Brandon, get me to play something, bro. Softly. Forgive and forget. That's kind of wild. Man, it's kind of wild. When that guy came with the and family, let me save his job. Honestly, what hit me was, oh, now you need me? Now you need me? That's just the human part of me. Now you need me? You cuss me like a dog, cuss me above the people. You talk junk about me. If your name was ever mentioned when I was around, somebody said, he really don't like you too much, does he? But I had enough sense to know this was a Joseph moment. I look for Joseph moments all the time. And I promise you, if you look for them, they're going to be there. Because a Joseph moment will bring peace to you. It'll bring double blessing. But without a Joseph moment, it may cripple you emotionally, mentally, spiritually for quite some time. So, to forgive and forget, it's not going to be easy. Not at all. Matter of fact, sometimes you want to say, really? <laughs> I mean, God, you, you put the bat in my hand, you put her head right there, I mean, I, I can sleep right now. I don't want to feel bad about it, Lord. He's going, no, I gave you the bat to defend him. Really? Yes. And so it's never easy. But it's always powerful. It's always productive. And it's always pleasing to God. I just want to read, I read these last week, but I need to read them again. President Garfield, the first president to be assassinated, was shot in the back. Six months while I was in office. I've been there six months. The doctors revived him, but they couldn't find the bullet. They probed and they probed. Alexander Graham Bell developed an electrical device to find it, but still couldn't find it. President Garfield died two months later, not from the bullet, but from the infection from all that digging. Stop digging in your past. It's not going to heal you. It's only going to hurt you. Drop it. Ask God to help you have a Joseph moment. And then this one here, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get everybody to stand. A snake entered a carpenter shop. And as it crawled to the corner, it went past the saw and was scratched a little bit. Along by the pain, it turned around and bit the saw, cutting himself badly in the mouth. Then thinking the saw was attacking him, he decided to roll around the saw to suffocate him with his whole body. As he squeezed, the saw cut deeper, leading the snake to get angrier and squeeze harder until eventually the snake died from his self 
inflicted wound. There's times in our life we all experience pain, but sometimes this pain has been inflicted intentionally and sometimes accidentally. Either way, when it happens, you have a choice. We can take a deep breath, we can forgive our adversary, or we can move on. I choose forgiveness and to forget. Everybody stand up. Man, oh man, that's a hard thought. Forgive and forget. Forgive and forget. If we're like kids, we do it all the time. Maybe if it's one of our family members, we do it as much as we can. If it's our spouse, we try. I read somewhere where, where God designed marriage so people wouldn't have to fight with all the time with strangers. <laughs> Three times. Before the cock crows, you're going to die me three times. And 
for the cock crowed and he denied him three times. And so he went out wept bitterly. He was him and Judas. Judas repented himself, hung himself, couldn't take the pain. Peter just went by himself, but the very first person he says, you could tell the disciples to him, Peter, that I'm risen. And he went to Peter with a personal audience. Because he forgave and he forgot. Every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to ask a very hard thing right now. Nobody, please, nobody looking around. Is there a certain people, maybe even certain things that have happened to you in your life that you're having a really, really hard time forgiving and forgetting? Oh, I forgave, I forgave, yeah, but have you forgotten? Because if you haven't forgotten, you're still holding on. Slide of the hand and say, I, I got some of those. I got some of those that, that I honestly, I forgave, but I honestly did not forget. I, I need you, God. Quit putting those hands up. I, I, I need that. I need that. I need that. Touch them. Lord. Touch them. Touch them. Grace is an amazing thing. Not just because the song says it, because it's just awesome. And remember this. When you spread grace out for somebody else, the Bible tells us in Galatians, you better, you better use humility when you're reaching to somebody that's, that's done wrong. Because you could be the next one. I've seen people over the years that somebody's child got in trouble or somebody's somebody something's got in trouble or something happened, they were other people were hard on them. Until it happened to them, then all of a sudden now they see a whole different perspective. That's why you need to keep your list short. Forgive, forgive. Are all hearts and minds clear? Let's pray together. We're just going to our special prayer and our going to our prayer for this. Lord, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for what you've done. For what you've done. I thank you. I thank you. The Calvary, Calvary removes, removes any excuse that we have for holding grudges. Calvary removes any excuse for not forgiving and forgetting. Father, help us draw close to you and help us learn how to use the grace blanket. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, we're going to close this way. We're going to do something different this morning. Here's how we're going to close. We're going to close with the Lord's Prayer. All right? Uh, it's kind of wild because you think everybody knows the Lord's Prayer. And I know all y'all do, but I was in B5 last week, and one of the guys said, can I get a copy of that? That's quite an amazing prayer. And it kind of just shocked me. <laughs> I said, uh, You've never heard the Lord's Prayer? He said, never. And he said, man, oh man, is that awesome. Wow, because it covers it all. Even forgiving and forgetting. Ready? Y'all say it with me. This is going to let us my silly little size, man. Come on. Who's going to let you could at this? Who brought us here? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Father, you're dismissed.